Notice is hereby giving that a meeting of the Salem-Kaiser School Board, District 24J of Marion County, Salem, Oregon, is called for 6 p.m. October 25th, 2016, in Room 2 at the Support Services Center, 2575 Commercial Street, Southeast, Salem, Oregon, for the discussion of student achievement. Let the record reflect that we are all here except for Chuck Lee. Christy? All right, uh, welcome. And uh, tonight we have two purposes. One is to review our SBAC results, specifically as it's aligned to the board's results policy. There are a number of other data points related to SBAC results that don't fit in with the results policy. We will have those in a handout for you. So some of the comparisons to state average, we'll give those to you at a certain point just as a handout. Um, and then the second thing I wanted you to hear from our level office team is uh, what are our strategies for improving our schools and how do we monitor schools and intervene prior to schools struggling? As you know, um, we've had five elementary focus schools and um, my goal is that uh, you'll see that we're trying to intervene before we get to focus school status, even though we're in this change with ESSA. I wanna be really sure you understand how we're monitoring to be sure that our schools aren't in the bottom 5%. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Carlisle, who's gonna go through the achievement report and then he'll hand it off uh, to the level director team as it works. And are we going to get a copy of these? Yes. So, yep. Thank you, Superintendent Perry and members of the board. Uh, as uh, Christy mentioned, my job is to share with you data that uh, relates directly to our results <coughs> policy. I want to start with um, a slide that has a familiar graphic, something that we've seen before in terms of the pie chart of our, our student demographic. On the left side, that shows the breakdown by ethnicity. And then on the right side, the breakdown by uh, subgroups that we monitor. Another slide that may look familiar to all of us. Uh, this is a representation of uh, the breakdown of our English language learners uh, by level. Um, and um, you can see that the majority of our English learners are in the elementary level. Most, but certainly not all, successfully reach a level of proficiency with English before they move on to middle school. Um, it's worth noting also that uh, middle school has 30% of its ELL students that are dual identified as English learners as well as um, students with disabilities. And at high school, that percentage is 31%. And before we dive into more data, it's important for us to just review the language that's in our results policy, uh, specifically um, item number one. There will be an increase in the percentage of students in the following subgroups who meet or exceed the state benchmarks in reading, writing, science, mathematics, and English language attainment. The major racial and ethnic groups in the district, students with disabilities, English language learner students, economically disadvantaged students, and students designated by the district as talented and gifted. And just one note, uh, with regard to English attainment, we will not be getting that data from the state until January, so we'll need to be reporting that uh, uh, information to you later this year. So this next chart shows um, a breakdown uh, by grade and ethnicity of the students who participated in the state assessment. And as a school board, you have a host of data and information that comes at you throughout the year. So at the risk of being a little bit redundant tonight, I'd like to share just a few key terms along the way that might help everybody make some sense of what we're, we're looking at. So by looking at English language arts uh, th on this slide, what you'll see is the number of students who participated in the state English language arts test by grade level and by ethnicity. 
And oftentimes we describe these groupings as cohorts. And please notice that the grade levels um, uh, that are tested um, do show um, a skip after eighth grade. And that'll become important for us to notice uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit later on. So as we talk about cohorts, here's our definition. I think it would be super helpful for us to remember that cohorts are dynamic. Um, they move, they change, they shift uh, uh, as they move throughout the system. The numbers change almost daily as students <coughs> move in and out of the district. And uh, so as we think about monitoring cohorts, just almost view that as a dynamic and ever-changing number. And in Oregon, for instance, the graduation rates are based on cohort data that would officially start on day one of the ninth grade. Um, and that'll come into our conversation a little bit later in the evening. So uh, while we're talking about cohorts, let's take a look at this slide. You're looking at four cohorts on one slide. And what we're seeing specifically is how they moved in their performance on the state English language arts test from third grade to fourth grade, from fourth grade to fifth grade, another cohort from sixth to seventh, and one from seventh to eighth. And you've probably already figured out the reason why we're not seeing high school cohort data on this slide is because we haven't had enough years of state testing for that to happen yet. Since we don't test at the ninth and 10th grade, we don't have that uh, level of data. And we won't until um, this year's sophomores will test in the spring of 2018. And then we can share that cohort data with you in the fall of 2018. Hope that makes sense. So let's examine some of that same cohort data, but this time disaggregated by ethnicity. And this first slide that you're looking at is um, the cohort that moved from third grade to fourth grade. They tested last spring as fourth graders, so they are now this year's fifth graders. Okay, another slide shows the cohort from fourth to fifth grade, again by ethnicity. I noticed that we um, inadvertently deleted a slide, fifth to sixth, and we can certainly get that slide for you. But here's a slide that shows sixth to seventh grade. And then finally, seventh to eighth grade. What I'm gonna do for the high school graphic is show you how our students fared on the state English language arts assessment as compared to their peers across the state of Oregon. Um, I will mention that um, later this evening you'll be receiving a supplement. As Christy mentioned, there's even more data that we can share with you. And in that supplement, it can show you the breakdown by ethnicity about how our students uh, fared in each of these um, uh, categories by ethnicity, spe special populations, um, or cohorts. Kelly, um, <coughs> it, it's interesting to me that like every other year, certain groups seem to dip and on the opposite year, they jump. And th is that to be expected? I mean, the, most of our groups are doing better each year, and then both our Pacific Islanders and um, African Americans some years don't, but then the next year they seem to make bigger gains. Is that yeah, I wanna come back to our pie chart way at the beginning of the, um, of the uh, slides that we're looking at. And what might be helpful to remember is the number of students who are participating. Right. Right. And um, we're going to see more um, volatile changes up and down uh, with the 
um, smaller uh, percentage populations. Yeah. Sorry, I should have remembered that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Kelly, if I may, <coughs> Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, Rick. Rick has hand up. Sorry, Rick. I was looking up there. Uh, the slide that was <laughs> just after your, your pie chart. Sorry. No. Just after the pie chart. Are you now? Are you okay with that? Are you I don't want to make people dizzy here, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so long this this one here? With, it's the chart with all the groups. Go ahead, keep going. Next one. I'll go forward. Keep going. Right there. That one. Uh, and looking at the white versus Hispanic, it's really interesting, the sixth grade group, look at the difference there compared, all the others were about 200 to 300 students difference, but at sixth grade, 1,100 students different in the two populations. Is that, is that an error or is that true, really true? That's kind of odd. You know, I think even though we've um, combed over this data a number of it times, that sense. looks like an odd number okay. to me as well, and I would imagine that um, it's just a typo. Okay, uh, thanks. I apologize for that. Problem. I just wanted to. Okay. Jim? So you don't have to go back to it, but on the pie chart, we show poverty. Will we see a breakdown of poverty data at all, or do yes. we just do it? Okay, so we will yeah. see that. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> this first section of the slides that we're looking at is a uh, breakdown by ethnicity. Under the and results. Then we're going to come sure. back and take a look okay. at uh, uh, special populations, uh, uh, monitored subpopulations. Any questions down here? I want to thank Kelly for giving us color diagrams in our handout rather than gray shades. Thank you. It's really helpful. You're most certainly welcome. The credit really goes to Mary Paulson. Okay. Yep. So then we turn our attention to math. And again, similar chart. And we seem to have that same anomalous number for Hispanic and Latino, which makes me wonder what's up. Well, once you make a slide, you grab it for other parts of the presentation. That if it's an error, it stays. Sure. Well, what's interesting, though, is that this slide, when you compare it to the English language arts one, the numbers are close to each other, but not identical. Oh, okay. And the reason for that, again, is that cohorts are dynamic. And so students who participated in the English language arts test may not have been with us by the time we did the math test. Mm -hmm. So um, cohorts are dynamic. So again, we're looking at four cohorts here and how they fared <coughs> over two years time. And again, we're not seeing cohort data yet for the 11th graders for the same reason. And then when we want to see that breakdown by ethnicity, here's how that looks from third to fourth. Fourth to fifth. Sixth to seventh. And seventh to eighth. And again, just as we did for the high school language arts, here's how this looks for high school math, broken down uh, by ethnicity. We can pause here if there are questions. Do you have a question? Uh, what happened with the third to fourth? It what looks happened like with the third to fourth? Yeah, for math. Looks like almost every group went down. Mm -hmm. um, a number of things can contribute to um, shifts and changes in how students are faring. One thing to keep in mind is that typically when we introduce a new assessment, it does take a little bit of time for um, staff to adapt uh, to new assessments and um, helping students learn how to be successful in navigating across a new assessment. The other thing that I think is important to remember is that we have just embarked on a large implementation 
of literacy materials. And so as we put a lot of energy forth in that arena, it might not be surprising for us to see um, a slight dip uh, in uh, how students may have done in math. Um, that's not to say that um, we're not uh, monitoring that closely, but of course we are. Uh, but uh, it's not unusual for us to see implementation dips, uh, especially in the early years of, of adapting to a new assessment. Okay. So uh, now we're going to shift our attention to the same data, but now it's disaggregated by the populations, the subpopulations that we monitor, specifically the economically disadvantaged students, our English language learners, our students with disabilities, and talented and gifted. I do want to explain that in the cases where you are seeing a dash instead of a number, the explanation that we've been given from ODE is that the numbers were not reported because overall, either the participation or the performance for that group is below the 5% meets and exceeds, and therefore their rationale is that publishing the data could inadvertently result in um, giving identifiable information about particular students. So we can share more of a disaggregation of the data with you, but we wanted to be consistent in terms of using the same data source for everything in this presentation, and that data source is ODE. <coughs> So when we look at cohort data for our economically disadvantaged students, here's how they did in English language arts and in math. And again, we're not seeing high school cohort data just yet. This is how our students with disabilities fared. and our English language learners. These tests are given in English. These tests are uh, given in English and students must um, write to express their thinking. They need to write to describe how they approach solving the problems in math. They need to write to describe the critical thinking process um, in both um, areas and uh, so it uh, might not be surprising that the level of writing that's required in English is going to be a challenge for a student who's learning English. This is our uh, talented and gifted population and how they did. <coughs> And then this is our comparison at the high school level uh, compared to um, state averages. And then in math. So let's dive in just a little bit more uh, with our English language learners. We've got three separate categories here. We've got the students who are in program. That means they are currently enrolled and participating in English language development uh, programs. We have the students who are in transition, which means they have reached a level of proficiency uh, that um, they are no longer receiving ELL services, but we continue to monitor them. And then we have the post-transition students um, who, uh, as you can see, are, are faring well. Um, and we continue to monitor them even though they, can, uh, they are no longer receiving English learner services. Those bars mm -hmm. represent all grades. Uh, fifth grade for grade. this one. That's just fifth grade. Sorry, let me back up. Okay. And here's eighth grade. I got you. All right, didn't see that. and 11th grade.
we know that we have a lot of work to do to um, see these uh, numbers rise, these percentages rise. And we'll be talking uh, with you uh, tonight, but as, as well as tonight, we'll be talking with you more uh, when the state data comes back to share with you uh, the strategies that we're using to help students uh, be successful as they're learning English and navigating through these content areas. When we come to science, um, we're still talking about state assessment results, but we are no longer looking at smarter balanced results. Um, science uh, is measured on the Oaks science test. It's a computer-based test that takes about an hour for students to complete. Uh, we monitor them, or they, we, they participate in uh, the Oaks science test in grade five, grade eight, and grade 11. Specifically, what we're measuring is uh, how well students have mastered science skills and knowledge in physical science, life science, earth and space science, and engineering design. Mr. Kelly, does the Oaks test, I know we've been trying to implement an excellent science. Is the Oaks test updated to do that, to reflect that? I don't believe the Oaks test is uh, adapted yet to next gen science standards, but I would need to get back with you on that. So the reality is this may be testing. I'm getting a big no from the gallery. That's my yeah. understanding. So yeah. these, there could be a disconnect between what we're teaching and what this is measuring. Very well could be. And we're seeing sort of a uniform uh, result here when we compare the district to the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. And it is an area that we need to monitor more closely and address. And it may be very different once the test is aligned to the new standards. So we can pause for more questions if you have them, or we can move on to the next part of the results policy. Nancy. Jim. So, I mean, I understand that we're testing with Oaks. When are we gonna have the new assessment for science, Kelly? You have to remind me of that. I think it's several years off yet. I'm getting a resounding yes from the gallery. <laughs> uh, I think they, um, pardon me. Eighteen nineteen is uh, what we currently believe. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So now we're going to take a look at the. Um, Next portion of the results policy, um, and this is our graduation rate. The percentage of students completing high school through their participation in any district sanctioned program will increase each year. Um, we've sort of held steady for the last couple of years, um, especially in the four-year four cohort. Um, we just uh, slightly uh, dropped in the five-year cohort and completion. Remember that the completion is inclusive of GEDs and modified diplomas. And if you're interested, when you get your supplement, there's a breakdown uh, by ethnicity uh, on uh, graduation rates. The other thing to um, point out, the, the font is fairly small here, but the latest data that we have is actually for the graduation uh, class of 2015. Uh, annually, we get the official uh, percentage from uh, the state in late January or early February. So we will know the 2016 graduation rate that's published by ODE uh, in a couple of months. The final portion of our results policy addresses the dropout rate as it compares to the state average. <coughs> I think this is a significant statistic when you consider the size of Salem-Kaiser and the relative size to the rest of the state. By having 
a 0.5 percentage lower than the rest of the state, we actually are helping to pull down the dropout rate across the rest of the state. We really need to credit the work of our K-12 system, our schools at every level, for working diligently to change the culture to one that really honors re-engagement for students who have some sort of a disruption to their education. That may happen at the elementary level. It may happen at middle, and it certainly happens at high school. I also want to credit the work of our graduation coaches who um, every day, all day, their work is uh, around re-engaging our students and bringing them back into some sort of a completion plan that helps them move forward and, uh, and do so with a diploma or a GED. Yes, we have far to go, but I'm proud of this statistic and what it represents for Salem-Kaiser. Questions? Rick? Is there a way to get at the, the state average without us blended in? Is that data available? I mean, does it move up to 4.89 or, I mean, it moves up, but that'd be an interesting number. That would the, be an interesting if number. If the data is available for us to calculate ourselves. Yeah, we could certainly do the math on that and, yeah. and give you the, the hypothetical. Yeah. Yeah. Jim? So I guess my question is a little pointed. If you look at our results policy, we met some of the first one, or there'll be an increase in our subgroups. We met some. We didn't meet others. We didn't do so well with our, our black students, to be real blunt. We did not meet our goal or our result in graduation rate in any of those categories. We didn't meet. And we met in the dropout. So what's our plan to get us to meeting in all of those? Great question. It's the one that, uh, it's the essential question that we're all going to need to grapple with. Uh, a little bit of hope that I have uh, in terms of uh, progress with our graduation rate, quite frankly, is what we've done to change the high school bell schedule. Um, we have given students um, more opportunity to earn credits uh, that will help them meet uh, the overall diploma requirements. And uh, I believe that for some students, that's going to make uh, the difference. It's going to allow them to uh, participate in more uh, support classes during the school day rather than um, racing through their school day every day without necessarily having the, uh, the supports that they may need in order to be successful. I believe that's going to um, show up um, even in uh, this next iteration of our graduation rate for the class of 2016, and it'll be more pronounced as, as uh, the years go forward. When it comes to um, what we're doing for um, our students by ethnicity uh, and by monitored subpopulation, I have uh, great faith and hope in the conversations that are permeating our culture around equity. Um, this is um, a long-range view, but I believe that it's the conversation that um, is going to help us move the dial in ways that we've not been able uh, to do so uh, thus far. Uh, and there's a number of uh, ways that I believe uh, the equity conversations move practice to uh, continue improving our support uh, and uh, teaching and learning for students in all of the subpopulations and ethnicities. So um, I'm grateful that the conversations are happening, whether we're talking about culturally responsive instruction or we're taking a look at disproportionalities in discipline or perhaps in family engagement. Those are the things that I believe are going to ultimately, over the long haul, help us uh, get to the place where we've truly improved uh, outcomes for students in all of those categories. So follow up to that, because mm -hmm. um, you just said it, and this I guess is the real question, you said over the long haul, how long are we talking? Because you lose a third grader, they don't do well as a fourth grader. You don't do well as a fifth grader. How long are we talking until we see improvement in those subgroups? And I know that's one that you probably don't even have a crystal ball, Kelly, that can tell us that. But that's the question I'm asking the district staff is, 
what's our plan, and how long is it going to take us to implement it, get there, and do the work? I think what's exciting is the uh, <coughs> next portion of tonight's presentation where we talk about how we're monitoring what's happening inside our schools. Because uh, uh, I don't believe we're necessarily going to see dramatic uh, changes quickly. I would love to say that we could. I believe that we're going to see incremental improvements in ways that we've not seen before. Um, if it was um, easy to have accomplished, we would have done it already. We're now at the place in each of our um, uh, efforts to support um, students in subpopulations, students with disabilities, English learners, um, uh, et cetera, where the next body of work is some of the most challenging work because we sometimes are talking about students with multiple identifications, uh, English learner and special education. So I, I guess this harkens back to a question I asked our previous superintendent. We're at that tipping point, really, where I've always asked, where are we going to be when our resources really match up with where we can take our kids as far as we can take them with the resources we've got? And what I'm hearing, and I'm not talking just money, I'm talking a variety of things. What I'm hearing at is we're at the really tough work that takes us to get over that hump and our resources haven't kept up with that and so we're kind of at that tipping point that i used to ask sandy about when are we because we had had pretty good growth we had had pretty continual growth for quite some time after we had resources it takes that next round of resources to deal with this next round of improvements we won't want to see Agreed. <laughs> so I do want to say to one of the um, things, and you will hear this from each level, is we know um, some of the strategies and we're trying to be really insistent with schools that there's two or three things that you do really well and we've put those on the strategic plan. Uh, the um, escalation of student behaviors has really um, caused us um, something with positive behavior supports we probably should have embarked on three or four years ago. So uh, they will tell you about the strategies they're using and we believe those are the right strategies and we're being really insistent on you got to do these three things really well. So that will be part of that hard work of us not getting <coughs> uh, distracted by everything else that comes at us. You know PE minutes and all of that, we've got to keep focused on the two or three strategies that we know will make the difference. Thank you. All right, so um, the next uh, part of the agenda is I just have the supplemental data and I won't um, walk you through all of it, it's just yours in color again. But this is the data that um, compares us uh, to the state average. It also puts the N and the cohort size in there. And then one of the requests from the board was around, um, I'm trying to think where that was. One of the requests was around those students uh, that do not have a label and that's in this as well. I'm not seeing where it is offhand, which page number. Slide 22. Page 11. Page 11. Um, and so those are the students that do not have a label and how they are doing compared to the Salem-Kaiser School District average and the state average. But this is the other data that doesn't align with the results policy, but is data you might be interested in. So, um, I, and I won't take time to go through each of those with you. Uh, this, the last portion of our um, report tonight is around the strategic plan report, review and align our assessments to inform a multi-tiered system of support to meet the needs for differentiated instruction and planned interventions for all students. And to continue to eliminate the strategies designed to eliminate the achievement gap. 
And I want to start by having um, our elementary director, Lisa Harlan, share about state report cards and what those tell us and how that plays into our monitoring system. You hear a lot about state report cards, but I don't think we've ever taken a few minutes to talk to you about what's there. And from there, then, the elementary directors will talk about here's what we're doing to improve the results. All right, Lisa. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Perry, members of the board, we're going to talk a little bit about um, state school report cards, um, what they currently look like, and some anticipated changes. Um, so I think the first thing I'd want you to know is they've changed over the years and will continue to change. Um, state report cards, you might remember, used to um, kind of be AYP. You either met or you didn't. Um, it might give you percentages for achievement. That kind of changed and morphed a few years ago to include growth. So our um, report card really went from um, achievement-based to achievement and growth. So much so, in fact, that the state school report cards now, 75% for elementary school of the weighting in the report card is growth. Um, and so really a focus on how much, regardless of where kiddos come in and start, how much can we grow students? It used to be that if a student came in really low and you worked, 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 and they still didn't get over the bar, there was nothing that um, illustrated all of that growth in that student. It was just if you made it or you didn't. So um, I want to um, point out that for state school report cards, achievement, growth, and graduation rate, of course, for high school, as well as subgroup growth and achievement are, are what um, schools are judged on for the state school report card. Those things won't go away. Growth, achievement, graduation rate will still be part of the state school report card. But also, um, what will also come into play are things like chronic absenteeism, discipline rates, um, because the state's currently looking at changing how they identify um, schools for improvement. So. Um, we have had in Salem five schools um, that were identified as focus and or priority at the elementary level, other um, SIG schools at the high school level and, and things like that. Um, and so part of what we want to have is a system to be able to monitor schools so that we know how they're doing long before anybody has to come in and tell us, you know, things aren't going well. Um, one major difference that will happen next year for high school for the state school report card is that only title schools in the past were eligible to be labeled as a school in need of improvement. For high schools next year, that won't be true. Any high school with a graduation rate of 67.5 or below will be labeled a school in improvement status, regardless if they're a title school or not. That's a huge swing and shift from um, what it has been in the past. It used to just be looking at title schools. Um, Currently, schools that were in improvement status were either at the bottom 5% or the bottom 15%. That will shift to just the bottom 5% and also schools that show market gaps, achievement gaps that aren't closing. So I think you have in front of you uh, just a sample of a state school report card for an elementary school in our district from this year. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things um, that are helpful details and ones that we look pretty closely at. You'll notice on the front page that the overall level, there is no rating. No school received a rating this year or last year, and likely in the future, there won't be overall ratings that schools receive, but rather there will be a dashboard with data and a determination whether or not that school is in need of improvement according to the data on the dashboard. Um, you'll see that there are three performance indicators. Academic achievement makes up 25% of the overall rating, academic growth 50%, and subgroup growth 25%. You'll also notice this year it was helpful um, that those performance indicators did receive a leveled rating. Those ratings are norm referenced across schools in Oregon. So that tells your school how you're doing in that performance indicator against other schools. The reason those um, ratings for those performance indicators were so helpful and valuable to us this year was that by having that information, we could calculate what the overall rating would have been. Many of our schools wanted to know that because if you were a school <coughs> who was labeled a focus or priority school, you want to know how you're doing 
Um, you want to know if you're progressing, and if you don't get an overall rating from the state, it's hard to know how you're doing in their eyes. And so one of the things that we did was calculate what the overall rating would have been for elementary schools across the board in the district to see um, how we were doing. One of the other, the second page is helpful in that it gives you more detail by content area, by achievement growth, and student groups. Um, but perhaps one of the pages we keep an eye on the most is on page four, and it shows the academic growth in both content areas, math and language arts, and it tells us what the median growth percentile is for students in that school. The reason we keep a close eye on that is we know if there are gaps, specifically with student populations or within a school, that we need to have our kids growing greater than, at a rate greater than their peers in order to close the gap. The one thing to remember about this that makes it difficult and a bit complicated, in order to know what your growth percentile would be, because it's norm referenced, you would have to accurately predict how your peers would do. That's difficult to do, both in the, um, by school and by student. So because growth is norm referenced, we literally line up schools to say, up oh, your median growth percentile was this, 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 this. You would have to accurately predict how others would do to know what your place in line would be. So it makes it a bit difficult. But I wanted to just give you a quick primer on some key things that we keep an eye on that gives us helpful information about how to support schools um, and how to differentiate the interventions and support we provide to schools. So the Can next I stop slide. stop you one minute, yep. Lisa? Could Should you we? tell us, uh, just looking at this, what would be one or two things <coughs> you would pick up from this? Great this example? Yeah, great question. So the first thing I look at is growth, because I know if a uh, school shows high growth year after year, then achievement will come. So if I um, were to see a school that did, high, did have high growth after a number of years and achievement didn't come up, it would cause me to ask some very specific questions. Um, the, you know, the other thing um, that I look for and to be sure to understand, a lot of times people will ask by student group. Does that mean that, for example, students with disabilities are compared to other students with disabilities? No, they're compared to all students because it is designed to um, illustrate a gap. And that's important to remember because sometimes people think that it shows me as a school how we're doing with that subgroup compared to that subgroup and that's not the case, but it identifies some gaps for that school. Um, we're aiming for a four, right? At, at th that's the goal for me. We have schools that are at a five, and that um, I think will continue to be, but in terms, of, um, in terms of what the base is, I think sometimes folks think one, two, three, four, five, okay, a three is kind of the middle. No, I, we want all of our schools to be at a four or above. Um, but it gives you some just key data to know how students are doing in comparison to their academic peers and how schools are doing as well. So on this page um, where, that you pointed out to us on academic growth, mm -hmm. um, the percentiles, I would assume that the bigger the number, the better they're doing mm -hmm. in terms of their growth. Mm -hmm. And um, is it expected if in one year you did 50, you were at the 54th percentile. That, is that something that you view as sustainable? Like can you always be mm -hmm. expecting that kind of growth every year or do you feel like you get to a point where you're on grade level, you're growing, mm -hmm. then you would expect everybody the goal would be really to get just 50 or? Mm -hmm. It's a great question and it's a complicated question, correct? So um, there are times where you will have a student, let's say in one year, um, grows the same amount that they do the next year, um, but their growth percentile is lower because their peers grew more. So um, it can be difficult to determine or predict, a lot of times schools will say, what do I have to hit exactly to get um, to, the, to the next one? And you have to be able to accurately predict how folks will do, but you should, a, a good aim would be to have at least 50th or, or better 
so that your students are growing faster than the typical student, which would be at the 50th percentile. Chris? So <clears throat> how would you react with this data where 50, mm -hmm. 54 went to 43 and 56 went to 32 and a half? Mm -hmm. Do you look at mm -hmm. staff turnover, student turnover? <laughs> What's Gosh, there are just so many factors, yeah. right? But the first thing it causes me um, to do is to look at the more detailed growth to see how st certain student groups are doing um, and then what are some other factors in the school. So remembering for elementary school, growth is just fourth and fifth graders because you have to have two years of the same student taking the same test to be able to determine their growth. So achievement is third, fourth, and fifth grade. Growth is fourth and fifth. So oftentimes, if we have low growth, I start to look at interventions in the intermediate grades. What's missing? If we have high growth but achievement isn't coming up, we often ask the question of what's happening in the core in K2 um, to prepare students for when they get to the third grade. So there are trends in the data that would cause you to ask different questions about what you're seeing over time or what you're not seeing over time. Um, a big thing that we did this year in talking to schools about master schedule was really about access. So when we looked at our student group for um, students with disabilities and we started to ask the question, how much access do they have to core content? Because if you don't have access to it, you can't learn it. Um, what does access look like in these content areas and how do we ensure that special education will come on top of core content access for students? So um, we're pretty excited to see what that looks like at the end of this year, specifically for that subgroup because of that strategy. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not seeing it. Okay. Wow. I saw a thinking face, so I wasn't sure if one was coming. Um, so the next slide shows um, the elementary schools and their overall ratings in Salem-Kaiser. The first bar is um, the 12-13 state school report card, which was the overall rating was reported by the state. The next bar is the 13-14, also overall ratings reported by the state. And the last one is the 15-16, um, because we had enough data to be able to calculate it and what their overall ratings would have been. Clearly, levels one and two are not what we want to see. What you'll notice is that we had last year 13 schools, elementary schools, that were a level one or a level two, which means they were performing in the bottom 15% of the state. This year, we've cut that number by more than half, more than half, and we have six schools that are a level two and none that are a level one. Additionally, we've been able to increase the number of schools at a level three and also at a level four, which is what we want to see. Um, and then, of course, we have some at a level five, which means you're in the top 90th percentile of schools across the state. So we believe that the strategies that you're about to hear um, from my other uh, fellow directors um, have had an impact on how schools are doing and how they're progressing um, through this. I'm going to hand it over to Sandy Price, one of our elementary directors, and Heidi Litchfield. All right, you heard Kelly talk about a K-12 approach to improving graduation rates. It really does start at the elementary level. And you heard Christy talk about the strategic plan and those uh, two to three things that we really are asking schools to focus on and get really good at and we think these things have already begun to have an effect as per the slide that you just have seen. <coughs> so these three areas of ongoing focus, strategies for continuous improvement of instructional s practices to get student growth and achievement up, our direct access to achievement or data teams, these are regularly scheduled professional learning and job embedded professional development opportunities and grade level teams that Heidi is going to give you a lot more information about. And then two other areas are ReadyGen 2016 literacy adoption, which will help us have a guaranteed and viable curriculum for literacy instruction at the elementary level. And this year we have completed the implementation of across all of our schools and you'll hear more about that at another time, I believe. And then positive behavior interventions and supports is the last of the three 
that we're asking our schools to really get good at, really focus on, and this foundational school-wide system approach will lead to an opportunity for social emotional growth for all students and equitable access to instruction because we have supported behavior well. And Heidi is going to tell you more about data teams. Perfect. So data teams are teachers working in collaborative grade level groups to prepare for instruction and analyze student work. So when Jim was talking about how do we know um, how each student is progressing, data teams is really my response to that and understanding um, how students are progressing and what they need in the moment in, during instruction in their classroom. There are lots of benefits to data teams. Um, one of the, those benefits is a positive impact on student instruction and on student learning. So one of the statistical measures that we use to measure the various influences that impact student achievement is called the effect size. And so a typical effect size is 0.4. So you know that's just normal growth for a student. Um, that the instructional strategies we're, we're giving in the classroom, if they're at about a 0.4, that means that the students will grow about a year's growth. For collective um, teacher eff efficacy, um, things such as data teams, that is the statistical effect size is 1.57. So nearly four times the bang for your buck that you're getting um, for a typical um, growth of students um, you're getting for teachers working collaboratively together. So we really think that um, things like professional learning communities and data teams are where it's at for increased student achievement and we're putting a lot of our efforts for professional development um, into um, th things such as um, data teams. We know that teachers working together will really have a significant impact on student learning. Data teams provide a step-by-step -step process for improving instruction. They focus on um, helping teachers understand common core standards and then teaching them to the right level, so the right rigor and um, the right depth of knowledge for students. Data teams use common assessments um, to work together to monitor student growth and then they increase teacher collaboration as they work together to select instructional strategies and really walk away with lesson plans um, for their students and implementing in their classrooms. So I read an article this week that Sandy provided for me that really said data teams and professional learning communities help teachers feel good about being teachers because it causes them to work together. So um, I didn't include that, but it helps teacher morale as well when done well. So in order to um, put the data teams process um, into our schools. We know that schools and teachers can't do that without some good training. So we spent last year really focused on monthly trainings to provide instructional coaches and principals the skills they need to go into um, data team meetings weekly and coach teachers on the process and really understand it. This year we um, expanded that to include facilitators, so we have grade level facilitators that have been trained um, at every school to also go in and be coaches in that, in that process so that teachers will become really good at this process and get the full effect size um, from this strategy. And um, we also have um, Ed Excellence, which is providing support um, for Salem-Kaiser District as an outside contractor. They are the experts in data teams and in this process, and so they're doing distance coaching with our staff. They're coming alongside us and providing trainings and just really doing an exemplary job in um, providing our schools um, what they need in order to maximize the data teams process for students. Who's up next? Okay, questions for elementary before they. Yes. I don't know who the question's for. Um, I appreciate the, the graphs uh, on the, uh, slide 22, mm -hmm. um, but it looks like we're not doing so good compared to the state average. What are you back in? Are you back in this? Yeah. 
So it's not a question of the three of them? No, probably not. I had a question, but I didn't know who it went to. <laughs> Don't sit down, because I have a question for you all. Sounds good. So I'll hold my question. I think you need for, to. Yep. Um, nobody else has a question. I had a question. It's over You're here. You're going to think of it. <laughs> oh, well. I'll call you. I, we can come back <laughs> Okay. I know what it was. Okay. Okay. Uh, is this, um, I know that when PLCs started and uh, data teams, it was, um, I, those things I don't think are exactly the same thing, but they lead to each other, you know, if you're a good PLC, then you can be a better data team. That you, um, that it was kind of optional for teachers and I've asked over the years like how much are we moving to this is the norm versus this is that you know the cream of the crop do this but everybody else doesn't uh, where do you think we are in that like is this becoming the norm is it already the norm uh, what do you think um, I'll go ahead so it is the norm we have um, the three areas of focus that you, um, that Sandy talked about, uh, PBIS and um, data teams and implementation of ReadyGen. And so those are three, are three areas of expectation for schools. So kind of the non-negotiables. And we've determined um, levels of implementation for the next four years. So this year being year one for most schools in all three, but um, so that they can forecast the level of implementation that schools will be required to get to in the next few years. So we don't expect them to have arrived already, but in the next few years to build on their skills. So um, another question that I have relates sort of to testing, um, but also the instruction that <coughs> leads to successful learning. Um, when we were looking for a superintendent, we toured uh, Chavez um, a lot. We brought a lot of people through <laughs> Chavez. Um, and we always um, went into this little room where a PLC met and looked at data. And they had like a whole wall of stickies and um, different things. My memory about it, you know, I'm not a teacher, so, but my memory was like, different things that make you learn to read. Like if, you know, if you're gonna jump, if you're gonna do the long jump, you need to learn to run down the track, you need to do a good lift off, you, you know. And it was that kind of thing that it looked like for reading. And they like knew where every kid in their class was on all the steps to be, to be successful at whatever it was. And you know, the kid that wasn't doing very well you know, we'd go with the first superintending, and by the time we got to the end of the process, oh my, look at how far these kids have moved. Mm -hmm. So it feels to me like teachers are breaking down the process of learning so specifically, like this, wow, this kid has this gap. Mm -hmm. And if we can get that little piece learned for them, then they'll be able to jump over here. But the world of, the world that looks at our U.S. education system thinks that all we do <coughs> is spend our energy saying, well, you need to really learn this because it's the question, number two question on the SBAC. And then once you've got number two down, we're going to work on memorizing number three. Like, like our education isn't about kids learning things. It's about passing a test. And those two... What I saw in the schools and what I hear in the press and I hear from the community and I hear at the mic at our board meetings just don't seem to mesh. And um, that's a, sort of a dissertation and not really a question, except for you have a better view of how, how do those things mesh and how, how does the testing fit into this? Because it seems to me like so much of the work is being done in the day-to-day. -day. Like, it's not about this test over here. It's about, you know, how you get all those little steps. 
So I think one of the major differences with Smarter Balance from Oaks is that it's not necessarily a test that you can say this is number two or this is number three because it does two things. One, it requires you to be able to express your problem solving skills and your thinking, which is especially for mathematics perhaps a different way than I definitely learned math to just memorize the algorithm. I could kind of do it again, not really sure why it worked, but I knew that it did if I continued to do that. Um, so the critical thinking required to do well is different. Um, the other thing with, with literacy and the reason why you see a disconnect or perhaps hear it, um, public perception, but really for literacy, the SBAC requires students to be able to read different literature, fiction and nonfiction, on the same theme and be able to take multiple sources of information, gather it, and then make some conclusion about it and use detail evidence to cite why they think that. That's very different than what the Oaks did, which was you read a passage and then you had to answer some comprehension questions about the passage. So the entire approach to the test is very different and the skills required um, are much more than just um, you know, comprehension and, and kind of reading skills. It really is some critical thinking. And so the work that you really see in schools is schools trying to get very good at determining what the specific skill gap is to be able to fill that gap. So no longer is it, well, you're behind in second grade reading, so all of the kids who are behind are in this group. There are specific reasons why you might be behind, and we need to figure out what that gap is and fill that gap, because it's, off, it's not all of them. Oftentimes, it's a specific gap. And the better we are able to do that, the quicker we move kids through to get on and above grade level. And so I think we're getting better at those things. Um, and we're trying to build systems to enable schools across the system to be able to do that. So it's not school dependent, principal dependent, that we have things at the district office that are ready, available, and support schools being able to do that. Thanks. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to, are we gonna move on to middle school or to Marty's question? I don't have a question anymore. I was looking at it incorrectly. Okay. And it's been Thank explained you. to me. Thank you. I thought they looked like they were doing better than anyone. Yeah. yeah. Not worse. <laughs> All right, Mr. Biondi. Middle schools could come last this evening if that would be a good change. No. Yeah, oh. no. You're in the middle. <laughs> it's in the middle. It's in the good middle. Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to be able to talk about what middle schools are doing. I'm actually going to start with the second slide. I think it's 40, slide 48, because it speaks more to the core of what we do in middle school and we frame in terms of just our core instruction and our approach to curriculum teaching and learning it's we really use the framework of avid it's a very important um, framework for us and that's represented by wicker which is that acronym down the left and and also framing all of that which is also part of avid in a college and career uh, cultural perspective and so you'll see that uh, very evident in the schools when you come out and visit um, Another thing that's, that actually is specific or has AVID um, attached to it is our AVID Excel, which we're piloting this year, which is an effort to help students that are uh, ELL, second language students, either Y or recently transitioned students, also get into AVID. And so that's a program that uh, starts in our, most of our middle schools in the seventh grade. And so the idea is that they'll, have, they'll get the academic language support <coughs> they need so that when they get to high school, they'll be able to enter a regular AVID program. So that's, that's the core of what we um, are doing. But there's some other things that we also have as big, um, big issues, big, big rocks, I'd like to say, uh, for what we're doing this year. And a couple of them have already been mentioned, and I'm not going to go into detail uh, about those. I'd be happy to answer any questions. But those would be the data teams, very significant uh, structure for us, really the foundation of, um, of teaching and learning and teachers helping each other, looking at students and being able to intervene uh, with their first instruction. Um, and also uh, PBIS, which we are also, as in the high school, uh, Larry can speak to this as well, but we are, we've jumped in with both feet. All the middle schools are participating in that. And that's just, a, that's a new uh, launch for us this year. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then and then the uh, the avid pieces that were um, identified on the on the previous slide are on the bottom. But the thing I want to mention most of all, uh, sort of to address this this idea of how are we trying to monitor 
uh, growth and improvement of the students in our schools. And we, you know, we have lots of ways that all of us use. We, you know, we are in our schools every month. We are having those conversations with principals. We're walking in the classrooms. Uh, we're looking at data, uh, having conversations with our schools about their CSIPs and what their plans are to improve um, student uh, achievement, student learning, um, the ability of teachers to, to help students be successful. And so um, that is a lot of what we're paying attention to as we're going through schools. Uh, but one of the, the significant changes this year, and again, it's across all the levels, is uh, starting this focus, and it's the very top, the RTI, response to intervention. And so we have PBIS, which we often think of in terms of helping students uh, with their behavioral needs. They can be more successful academically. Um, response to intervention is, is more focused about their academic needs and helping them be successful in that way. And um, we've had response to intervention systems in our district for, for a number of years, but um, really taking a more comprehensive look at what we're doing for students. So one example of that this year is uh, we tested every single student, every single sixth grader with a, a reading screener this year, for instance. We haven't done that before. Uh, and the high schools uh, did all freshmen as well. And some of our middle schools tested all students uh, just so that we can get and start to wrap our arms around what are the needs we have very specifically by student in our schools so that we can start to design um, responses to that to, so we can intervene with students so they can be successful. And so this is uh, a start this year of a more comprehensive approach uh, to that specific, or using that specific strategy. And it's a work in progress. We're piloting a number of different kinds of tools this year to help us uh, give us a better idea of what the need is and also what possible tools uh, we might have to start to address those needs. So uh, that's a big focus. Uh, along with these other three areas. Questions for me? Paul. So are we going to AVID at all of the middle schools? AVID at all middle schools, yes. And, we, and we so have. We're we, buying the program at all the middle schools? We've had it, actually, for, okay. for a number of years. Do you know how much it costs? I don't. Okay. I don't offhand. Yeah, we've had the AVID, um, AVID elective programs in all of our middle schools for, for quite a few years so now. So it's, it's, it's an elective, so it's not for all students. Uh, the elective class is not for all students, but the strategies and the cultural aspects that AVID provide would be absolutely for all students. And so that okay. is actually we've uh, you know placed it specifically in our strategic plan because uh, AVID is really, um, it is a tool that we think all students need to have access to. So why do we need specifically AVID and not just the strategies? Why do we need to call it AVID? Why do we need that program and not just take their strategies and modify them for our own schools? Since the, what I know of AVID, they seem to be very standard teaching strategies that I learned a few years ago when I went through my program. Yeah, I think like it- Like 35. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of AVID strategies are just, they're good strategies. There, there might be some that, that seem to show up a little bit more in AVID's uh, literature than, than others, but I think it helps us frame that conversation and helps us focus uh, by, by uh, using AVID as a framework for us. And so it's been real beneficial. Instead of just saying best practice, which, you know, which can mean a lot of other things, AVID helps us, while there's lots of best practices that could fall underneath that, uh, there, there really are some um, things real specific that we really focus on uh, that we want in terms of strategies that we want schools to use. And so Abbott helps provide that framework for us. Good. Other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My colleagues are a little more verbose than I am, so I'll be in and out here. He's the closer. The closer, yeah. It's quick work, right? Three outs and we're out of here. It's just like my three bullets. So um, again, I'm not going to rehash everything Matt and the ladies before spoke about, but the first two there you see we're in line in terms of AVID. All of our PD is uh, really AVID-based in terms of uh, focusing on inquiry 
on the wicker, the I in, in wicker on inquiry, everything is loaded that way, mainly to get students to have a deep understanding to really make sure they're thinking critically about um, the questions that the teachers are asking. So we've really focused in on uh, making that a priority. You'll see number two there, PLCs or data teams. Again, uh, that we went in, in depth with that. It's really thinking about what are the, the adult actions that I'm doing as the teacher having on the students. So it's really focusing on that cycle of what am I doing and what impact is it having on the students and really teaming up as teachers to see what we find to be the most effective and what we can do as adults to change what we do to have an even better impact on what's happening with our students. Uh, the third bullet there, EOS, is our equal opportunity schools that we've been working on for a couple of years now. Um, each high school, each comprehensive high school is um, not only um, identifying and recruiting students, but they also are trying to retain these students in our AP and IB courses. So that is something that's a real big lift for us right now. We have first had our first six weeks of grading. We're looking at the reports to see um, how well our students are doing that have been identified through the EOS program and how they're doing in those more rigorous courses that we know we need to get them to for them to be successful um, being college and career ready and when, when it's time to take the S back if they're a junior but really making sure that we're getting everyone access to those classes that is my quick summary questions Chris I have a question that's really for everybody um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity through OSVA to go to the Teaching with Purpose conference. And that's a conference that's specifically, to, I think they're in their seventh year, and they're specifically designed to look at how our school systems in, have been working with historically underserved populations. Um, and pretty much the message that I got out of the conference was that creating schools that have a culture within them that make all students feel like they are members of the community and they belong. And I see that in your EOS program at the high school somewhat in, in basically saying to students who have traditionally not been invited into those courses that you mm -hmm. are invited in and you're part of our, an important part of our program. But what the message that came across pretty loudly is that when you build a culture inside of a school that makes all students feel like it's their school, they belong, it's belongs to me and I'm an equal part of this and people care about me and all those kinds of things that happen when you do the cultural shifts um, that a lot of these things sort of take care of themselves and I'm just wondering I heard Christy sort of allude to it earlier in the thing but I haven't heard anybody speak specifically to how we're working with staff in that idea of creating culturally inclusive schools Yes, well, definitely, like, as you spoke, I think EOS really does target that. It's really looking at those student groups and identifying who has the ability um, and then knowing that we are going to have to provide some supports in terms of they're new to this program. And also, I think what Matt spoke about, AVID also provides that culture of getting kids ready for college, getting them into those rigorous courses as well, and providing that culture of support of um, and, and as you stated, really, it's all about building those relationships with students so everybody feels uh, welcome in those classes and welcome in any part of the school, whether it's an academic program or uh, or any other program, that, that you're welcome here and we want you here. So I'm going to make one comment. Um, an example of how uh, Equal Opportunity Schools has um, is beginning to change culture <coughs> is related to uh, some of the work at McKay because what McKay found is you can't wait till AP but that there's a track and trajectory for kids and that you really need to back it up. So they start with freshmen in math to begin accelerating so that they're on track for an AP calculus class. They do the same thing in English. So it started by going, oh, wow, look what kids can do, but we've got to start sooner. And I think that's what shapes that culture. We are um, having those uh, conversations administratively about culturally responsive practices, because that's really a targeted area that we need to do um, some more professional development on. What came across loud and clear in this conference was dealing with structural inequalities within our systems and how we identify students for and recommend students and do all that kind of stuff, but also dealing with the implicit biases that might be unbeknownst 
to ourselves Correct. and that we we react in certain ways to certain kids because of the way they look or their ethnicity or who knows what um, are really key and and the only way teachers and administrators can find their way past those things is through hard work on themselves and and I'm just wondering that's what I'm looking for is are we doing anything yet in this district around the idea of, of advancing our our staff's own knowledge of themselves with regards to these kinds of issues and and really looking hard at our own structural system and how we are recommending how we are you name it disciplining whatever the issue that's going on in school how we're making sure that those are equal and yes. um, have equity it's back to our conversation from our last work yeah. which and we're doing that same sort of work across our joint labor management group with pace and with our administrators and we really do need to begin a plan for how we actually get that sort of professional development because it is hard work on ourselves it, it is. for and, that and, it, and what I what I heard there and, and it only supports what I already believe is that unless you do that work um, it's very very difficult to engage these historically underserved populations and and I'm just hoping to see that our district takes that seriously and I hadn't seen it in the slides I, I've started to hear pieces of it but I, I think it's important that we do that work oh. you've got a thought for elementary for us um, that specific work has really been rooted in PBIS because at the elementary it is um, no longer sorting good behavior bad behavior right it's really about meeting kids where they're at trying to figure out um, is it really a behavior or is it a need an unmet need how do we as adults respond to that um, and not escalate it, but really kind of problem solve. But it really is about how do we as adults look at whatever the behavior is as a problem or as disrespectful or as defiant instead of behavior being a function of communication in small children and figuring out how to meet kids where they are and give them skills. So at the elementary level, it really starts with PBIS for us getting at that um, culturally responsive approaches, especially to discipline but instruction as well. I went to a really neat session where a person was taking the idea of restorative justice as an, as, an, as an alternative to our traditional discipline strategies and melding that with PBIS and the way they were using PBIS and restorative justice together, which I thought was pretty cool. So I, that's, that's what I wanted to hear a little bit of, and I hadn't heard it, so I thought I'd ask the question. Paul. So, Larry, I want to make sure I'm understanding. Okay. So the AVID strategies are permeating the high school level as well as the middle school level. Yes, sir. How are, so if I go and ask, which I probably will, a high school teacher, and I say, to, I say to him or her, mm -hmm. are you teaching AVID strategies? They're going to say to me. They're going to say to you there's most likely, there is, not most likely, there's an expectation that these AVID strategies okay are incorporated a certain amount of times like can, i can quote you off the top of my head okay. with sprague it's going to be north um you know once twice a week the, the, uh, or twice in every lesson there's going to be two wicker strategies but over the course of two weeks all five okay. of the wicker strategies would be used and they're identified as avid strategies because of their wicker they're not just good teaching pre best practice strategies they are good teaching strategies, but they'll fall under but one of those say, categories. But if I say, which AVID strategy are you following today, or in they this would lesson, yeah. they'll know. Yeah, and they the would know I'm doing writing, inquiry, or collaboration, or organization, reading, yeah, they'll, they'll be able to know which of those so they're we, hitting on. Are we having the AVID trainers come in to teach this stuff? They go in the summer, so they, we tend, they, I couldn't tell you how many off the top okay. of my head, a ton of teachers to Denver, Okay. Um, every summer where we're already making plans to go again. But that's not anywhere near the 2,500. Anywhere near, no, no, not every single, no, but there's also PD that's. That's what I'm asking. Yes, PD by the who, instructional who coaches, the by principals, by assistant principals that okay. also allows them to get the strategies because no, we can't send 2,500 teachers what, to that's Denver. What, that's what I'm asking. You tell me it's, yeah. it's everywhere and everybody, but you can't do everybody everywhere. No. No, we send the ones that we can afford to send, and then the rest get training in-house. And we focus on different strategies through our IL content. Yes. And um, Barb Bamford actually leads the um, professional development for the district. Okay. Thank you. Jim? Nope, come back. Oh, sorry. You're not done. 
Jim. So, Larry, when you talk about our AP and IB courses, mm -hmm. and we had a, I think we had a data point, it was either last year or the year before, that showed the growth in each one of our high schools of the addition of classes, of the, of the additional offerings. But what I've not seen, and what I would like to see, is the data on the number of our subgroup high school students that are taking AP and IB courses. And I haven't seen that in any of the data fields that we've got, even in the supplemental, I just did a quick peruse. I'd like to know at our yeah. high school level of the subgroups and even throw in economically disadvantaged kids, mm -hmm. what's the number of those kids taking those offerings? We could, get, we, had, we could get that. Yeah, I knew we had pretty dramatic growth in offerings at our high schools. I think, Kelly, you may have presented that a couple of years ago to us. Um, but I've never seen that data. So that's some data I'd like to see yeah. uh, on, on those off how many of our kids are, are taking advantage. I of. also think that's a really good data point for you to monitor because that is the gap we are looking at right. for in APIB. So um, that's an important data point for you to look at. Chris? We can get that. This is another one probably for both middle and high school. Um, and it, it comes down to AVID. I, I happen to be sitting in between an AVID teacher and Nori Duba at something. And Nori is on the national board for AVID. And so I got started talking to the two of them about AVID. And, and, uh, and basically my question was for them, if we were to, if we now look at the number of our, the percentage of our students that go on to college, and it's, 28% sometimes you read and sometimes it's 33. It's around those kinds of numbers. If we were to successfully implement AVID all the way through with all of our students, what percentage of our students might we actually be successful in getting to enroll in college and go on and, and get a higher degree? And what I'm looking at is 40, 40, 20 and asking that question. Um, the question that I really continue to have is, if that number is 50%, if that number is 80%, if that number, wherever that number is, that we can actually get ready to go to college and be successful in college, what are we doing for the others? There's still a percentage of kids out there, and I think it's about 50% personally, who don't want to go to college, who are very, are not real interested in um, the sort of academic way of learning. Um, what are we going to do for those kids? And I, it's not a question we need to answer tonight, but it's a question I continue to deal with on a regular basis is, in my own mind, is, um, and I think CTEC and those kinds of programs are part of the answer to that, but how do we deal with the fact that we have um, a way of looking at what college readiness looks like, and for those students that don't fit that model, how do we deal with them, is my question. If you got a re if you got a thought about that, shoot it at me. If not, that just know that that's on my mind. <laughs> I do think we've had that ever so slightly shift to college and career, mm -hmm. and the growth in our career technical education programs are part of what answers that. And they are pathway programs, whether it's a pathway to work or a pathway to mm -hmm. college or uh, technical. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's you've seen that shift in our in our work. I continue to hope that those students in that career bound group are actually graduating with very similar skills to the group in the college bound group, but they just want to do something different with them. That's my dream. <laughs> and how do we get there is the question. I have a question for both of you as well. Um, what Chrissy said about uh, McKay and understanding that you didn't just identify it uh, end of the year seen sophomore as being appropriate for an AP class that you need to start with freshmen um, what's happening at the middle school in that regard to to plant those seeds of you're capable of this um, I don't know these days how much differentiation there is in levels of courses um, at the middle school, but are there ways that those kids get identified um, and help to make those kinds of choices going into the high schools? And in the same regard, what exposure and information do middle school students get about the career tech programs um, 
and what kind of supports do high schoolers get who are interested in those career tech programs to make them have the the backgrounds to be successful at jumping into those as juniors and seniors. Do we have the same kind of model for prep for those programs that we have for AP and IB? You asked like six questions. That's, <laughs> I'm good at that. I can tackle some of them. Um, interesting, because you, you had mentioned to me that to me about getting that uh, Linda, that teacher to a CTEC, and so there was an email string going around about counselors during at the next semester break going to CTEC and and um, and then I, I would like to open that up to, to, to teachers as well I mean they'll have to make an option of you know that's part of their grading time but if they have a, a couple hours on CTEC to see and explore that'd be great uh, we do have uh, opportunities and we make connections Jim Orth is is we're getting better and better at getting uh, students and staff down to connect with the middle schools and we're, we're in terms of uh, C, um, CTE programs and making those connections with the middle and high. That's a work in progress, but that's something um, that we meet uh, fairly consistently on to talk about alignment. At least he, he does a lot of that work and uh, aligning programs. Uh, in terms of uh, specific to acceleration and mathematics in the middle school, we recognize that students need to, to get on that track in order to get to the highest levels of math and serve them well. So. Um, this year in seventh grade math, we have almost twice as many students in accelerated math currently this year than we did last year. So we've made a really significant effort in that, that behalf, in that respect. And so um, uh, working on supporting those students, because some of those students, it's a push for them, you know, but we think that they have the ability to be successful. And so uh, really looking closely at that particular effort to, to help increase um, the preparedness of students when they get to high school. Great. And CTEC does a great job of um, recruiting, coming to high schools, putting on presentations, getting students out to CTEC so they can go out and visit. So there may be some in-home programs they may be able to do in McKay, but if they're interested in cosmetology, say, from McKay, they can now go out to CTEC and do that. But they do a good job of recruiting and trying to find the students that are interested in that career, whatever it may be, of, of the programs that we offer. really get at that question are other high schools besides McKay doing work starting yes. with freshmen to get freshmen ready for AP or IB classes yes I think the track has been if you look at the data the track has been that you go into honors if you're in honors then that's kind of been the track to AP and IB now we're also trying to break down the walls of, of um, honors and getting more students in there so that they get on that track towards AP and IB. So we're trying, as you say, we have to go back further and further. It really probably starts in elementary where they're already separated by groups and then more in middle and then even more at the high school. So these students, if you probably trace them back from AP to who knows where in the elementary, they were probably on a, a certain track all the way back as far as then. Right, I guess that's exactly my thought and my question. Like if we're, if if we're really committed to the equal opportunity schools, we need to be having those conversations across um, levels to make sure that every kid, um, I mean, Christy said at our last meeting that the, the most significant thing to get kids to try those classes was someone saying, I believe you're capable of that. And that waiting till they're juniors or the end of their sophomore year to, to make that statement to a kid is too late. So we, you know, getting that view of kids as capable, all kids as capable, and, and pushing that. Yes, we're working that back down the line so that we have more kids that are capable at, the, at, our, at our highest level in our most rigorous courses. So it's definitely, he and I are teaming up, and, and obviously elementary, they're working on the same thing. Um, to make sure all of our kids have access to the best classes, the most rigorous classes that we offer, from as early as we offer them to as to their 12th grade year. If you think back to the elementary example of the master schedule uh, changes and how one of the purposes was for students with disabilities to have access to core content, it starts there. That you give, you be sure you build the schedule that 
uh, kids can have access to grade level content so that they're building, if they never have access to grade level, they can't ever get there. So if you trace back to some of those strategies, that's where it is starting. Other questions? Looks like none. Thank you. I meant to be short, but it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's our fault. Summary. Christy right, Perry. I have uh, no other comments because you have done a good job of asking questions and summarizing. I think you can see from our data there are some clear places we need to head next as we bring in PBIS and the data teams and we begin to see that growth in reading. That next shift is going to be in math and also that shift in how do you give kids access to grade level contents. So you can see, a, uh, I think, a clear path for um, some of what needs to happen next as we stick on with our two to three really direct strategies. When the elementary uh, directors say these are non-negotiable strategies, these are really non-negotiable strategies for our school. The redesign of a master schedule so that kids have access to uh, grade level content is a non-negotiable strategy and I watched the directors work side by side with those principals until they all got it figured out. So those really are non-negotiable strategies. It's a place we're really tight with our leadership. We're uh, loose in helping the principal figure out how, what's the trajectory to get to those strategies because every school is in a different place and they're the leaders of those schools. Um, so I know there was a couple other data points uh, that were asked for, and we thought that was some of the work of our next upcoming work sessions um, around the results policy, and are there some um, different things you'd like to see for data? I do believe there's some key things with equal opportunity schools of data you ought to be watching. Whether it falls within the results policy or not, that would be up to you, but it, it should be the data you're looking at. And then I'll just open up if you have any last questions for me. Seeing none, um, I think uh, we will adjourn. I want to thank everybody for all the good data. Um, I think there's a lot of hope uh, in the data. I think there's also a lot of hard work, uh, but it felt to me like you all clearly know what the work is, which makes it easier to be successful at the work. So, Can I do a quick reminder? Remember, next board meeting, we're going to start at 5 because it's election night, so our business meeting will start at 5 on Tuesday, November 8th. That is correct. And with that, we are adjourned.